So tonight I'm going to talk to you about experimental design, reducing confounding factors. Anyone know much about uh, confounding factors? You know what these things are? Raise your hand. Confounding factors, you guys before? Okay, only about half. Okay, good. This is a good talk then. So I'm Max Pato. Um, so this, someone got a picture of me in the lab. Um, that's just... That's me there on the weekends, uh, pipe that in my hand. So um, I found a company named, just to give you a little bit um, about my background, just so you know, have an idea of who I am, where I came from. I found a company uh, making recombinant proteins for stem cell culture. Uh, I'm currently researching the Sense Foundation. I have been for about the past two years. Uh, I've been interested in a lot of different areas. Uh, so back in around 2000, I started computer science. Um, I dropped that, went into undergrad finance, worked in finance for a few years, got an MBA. Uh, did accounting uh, and then taught accounting at colleges for a few years. Uh, went back to school for biochem, uh, finished that, and then uh, got hired by Aubrey to do SENS research uh, in Mountain View in 2010. I've been doing that since then. So life extension specifically is what I've been interested in. Um, I started reading about Aubrey stuff in 2005. Uh, and in 2000, between about 2005, I started reading a lot of life extension literature. 2007, I read a whole bunch of science literature on metabolism and weight loss. Lost 60 pounds in about five months. Um, a little bit related to the same things Dave's going to talk about. Um, 2009, 2010, worked at three different science labs at the university. I published a paper in, on iron and aluminum accumulation in humans. Uh, and then in 2010, started working with Aubrey Sen. So tonight, this is what I'm going to go over uh, right now. Is first, I'm going to define confounding factors or confounds. What is that? Next, I'm going to talk about how to design experiments to reduce the effect of these confounding variables. And then I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example of, let's say, if you're going to do a quantified self-experiment yourself on one of these parameters, I'll go over some of these confounds you may or may not have been cognizant of. And then you'll kind of be able to see how these confounds can really mess up your data a lot. Uh, and then I'll give you three easy steps to control for confounds. This is step number four. Um, We'll go over those steps with an example too, a second example, which I think a lot of you have probably studied uh, yourself. And then I'll conclude with reviewing what it is uh, with these uh, steps to control for confounds and maybe some other tricks that scientists use. Uh, so confounding, I looked around for, um, for a good definition of this, and Wikipedia is pretty good. So here it is, in statistics, a confounding variable has a bunch of other names, is an extraneous variable in a statistical model that correlates with both the dependent variable and the independent variable. The independent variable is the one you're trying to see uh, to make an effect on, right? And the dependent one is you're going to vary. Either you're going to have it uh, or you're not going to have it. You're going to vary the presence of that dependent uh, variable. Uh, so for example, let's say you're going to do a self-study on HDL, right? You want to see what your, what you, if you can, let's say, for example, does green tea intake change your HDL cholesterol? And so if you're going to test this, right, and say, I'm going, to, I'm going to drink so much green tea every day, you're going to carefully measure how much green tea, and you're going to brew it very carefully. The question here is, what are, confounding, what are the confounding variables? What other things besides green tea are going to affect your HDL at any given time? That, these are the confounding variables. So I pulled some from the science literature, and these are interesting. Some of these you might not know. Lower fat intake, Dave, I know knows this. Lower fat intake will drop your HDL. Um, so if you eat a low-fat diet, here in the blue, I've kind of uh, highlighted um, some, some really important uh, conclusions or uh, results in there. So it says here, upon changing from high to low intake of saturated fat and cholesterol, the mean HDL decreased 29%. That's a big drop in HDL. Polyphenols. This has been studied uh, pretty thoroughly. This is cocoa polyphenols. Uh, more polyphenols will raise your HDL. Here in the box, it says a significantly greater increase in plasma HDL. 24% was observed in the cocoa group than in the control group. Now again, consider you're testing green tea, which also has polyphenols, right? So you're going to have to control how much chocolate am I eating, how much fat am I eating, all while you're doing this green tea intake. So another one, alcohol, this is a very well studied one, alcohol, ethanol raises your HDL in a dose dependent manner. Uh, and there it says uh, here, alcohol given uh, as vodka. Uh, HDL concentration increased 18% compared to control. And then what? Egg consumption? Did you know this? <laughs> right? Egg consumption. It says here, after six weeks of extra egg consumption, serum HDL increased by 10%. So these are all confounding variables. If you have 
two eggs on one day and not two eggs on the next day, you goofed up your experiment, right? Because these things influence a lot. If you have cocoa powder on one day and then uh, not cocoa powder on the other day, exercise again tr transiently increases HDL. So here are the three, or the, oh, I have four steps, and it's actually three. Uh, <clears throat> so here are the three steps that are really important to consider, very short. First is explicitly state the quantifiable variable you want to measure. Right, so HDL was one of the last example. Uh, the next example is going to be duration of deep sleep. Like this is something that you can measure, let's say, with Zio. So number two, extensively review all the factors known to affect that variable in a significant way. And this is even scary, right? Because we don't know what all the factors are that influence HDL or, or deep sleep. If we knew that, we, you know, we'd all have awesome HDL, we'd never have heart attacks, and we'd sleep great all the time. And then number three, once you know this data, Take a look at how you can control or hold constant, that's why they call them control, the compounds as best as you can. This is called controlling for compounds. So here's an example too. Let's say you're going to do a study on sleep uh, quality. So here at the bottom I have the example, duration of deep sleep quantified as, let's say, minutes per 24 hours. You might even include naps in there. Right? If you're super tired, you take a nap, count those minutes of deep sleep if you get any. Step two, extensively review all factors or, or confounding factors known to affect that variable. And Google, Google Scholar helps me a lot with this. This is really useful. You can say, like, you just type in um, decreases or, or, or impact sleep quality or lowers HDL, and you'll get all kinds of stuff. Um, so here are some examples of compounds. Alcohol intake, again, right? And this study was interesting, it says here, compared, uh, let's see, uh, by the beginning of the sleep episode, breath ethanol concentrations had declined to zero. So what they're saying is that the ethanol is already out of your system. There's some downstream effects. Compared with the control condition, sleep was perceived as more superficial. Sleep efficiency, total time, stage one, rapid eye movement were all reduced. Uh, here, caffeine intake also negatively affects sleep. Exercise positively affects sleep. This one here uh, showed increased uh, sleep quality um, with exercise, with an exercise regimen. Carb intake, this is a weird one, right? It turns out high glycemic carbs in the evening will help you get better quality sleep. It's funny, compared to low glycemic. They st it's still carbs, but it was high glycemic versus low glycemic. Blue light exposure, right? What are these lights? If you're at work versus when you're at home, do you go to work today, you don't go to work today, what's the lights at work? Are you spending your time outside gardening and not the next day? These are going to all affect uh, your results. Music at bedtime, 45 minutes, actually improves sleep quality, at least in older people. Interesting. Nasal decongestion, this one bothered me, right? Seasonal allergies, I have seasonal allergies, so it turns out that if you're stuffed up during the day, if you take a decongestant, you can get rid of that. So, just to review, again, those three steps. First, quantify those variables, uh, or figure out what, it is, what variable it is you want to quantify. And second, do as much research as you can, trying to find the confounding variables, and third, try and control for them. That's it, may you control well. Excellent. Up. Thank you, Max. So we have um, about seven and a half minutes for Q&A, so can you come on over here and put you on the hot seat? And um, are there any questions for Max? Yeah, Joe. Did you, uh, or do, do you explicitly think about your compounding variable sources in separate groups of, wow, <laughs> bigger now, um, in separate groups of um, uncorrelated compounding variables and correlated compounding variables where the correlation is, is with respect to your to your um, your, your dependent variable, your independent variable good question so um, in the talk this was actually the wrong version of the slides that I had sent so that's why I said I had four steps instead of three and I, there were a couple of those concerns I wanted to go over and I just didn't have time because it's such a big area so I don't know if you follow what Joe's saying here what he's talking about is that it turns out like alcohol intake and smoking tend to be correlated people who drink alcohol tend to also smoke people who smoke also drink alcohol so it could be what if alcohol intake 
uh, affects sleep quality, but also smoking affects sleep quality, but you're not controlling for smoking. Is that what you're talking about? You have kind of thing, yeah. other variables? Yeah, so that gets if very complicated. Think, uh, if you decide to, okay, I'm going to, uh, like, if you, if you don't change any of those other things in your life, maybe they just average out. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to be changing something specifically to try to affect, you know, I'm going to drink green tea now, and other times I'm not going to drink green tea. But there are some things that are correlated to drinking green tea, like sitting down for 15 minutes and relaxing. Oh. And, and uh, yeah. You know. Right? How do you drink the green tea? Yeah. yeah. Good maybe, point. maybe sitting down for 15 minutes and yeah. relaxing yeah. every day decreases your HDL. Yeah. Bad, you know? Yeah. And, right. and Joe this points out, and this is what, um, there was one slide in there I missed, uh, I just skipped over, was that there is a huge number of confounds. And so, like, in studies, the question is, like, big studies, right, where you give someone a questionnaire and say, did you drink alcohol? Did you? There are so many things that people do that affect this stuff that it's really, really hard to control for even a small number of these. So one of the things I was going to say up there is, is one thing that's useful is that you control very carefully for just a few at a time. Do one study where you don't drink any alcohol, no caffeine intake, drink green tea. See how that goes. And then do a different study where you control different variables, and then now you can you can kind of aggregate the data together. So yeah, that gets very complicated. Yeah. Um, have you found any really good resources that kind of list a lot of these these variables? Um, and do you have them someplace? Because I'm essentially raising a whole bunch. Yeah. Yeah. It would be nice. To make that <laughs> yeah. So the question was: Is there any um, kind of database or resource where you can find these confounding variables in a convenient place so you know what to control for? Unfortunately, no. I've never seen this. Yeah. Just in the past few days, when I was writing this talk, um, which one was it that blew me away? I think it was nasal decon or nasal congestion. I was like, whoa! No wonder I'm so like tired. Like I sleep like crap when it's allergy season in the summer. And um, it turns out when you're stuffed up like that. You don't sleep as well, so your sleep quality is bad. So the next day you're a little groggy, you're sleepy. And that study was saying uh, maybe the sleepiness was because you take allergy meds. And it turns out, no, it wasn't the allergy meds. It's the fact that you're stuffed up and it's inflammatory. One of the most important confounders that I've come across is time. So it turns out that the time you're exposed to something, the time you have the effect, can be days, and in, the, in fact, in the case of gluten, it can be up to six months after you have gluten, the final symptoms of it can leave your body. Mm. Uh, when I was starting my brain hacking, it turns out if I had gluten on one day, I was fine the next day, so I'm going, it's not gluten. But then it was the day after that I was like a total prick. Mm. Uh, that was the general effect, uh, that was gas. <laughs> so yeah, okay. anyway, make sure that, that you, when you look at these studies, that you expand your time horizons a lot, especially as you're zooming in on what you think is really happening. Yeah, good point, Dave. So one example of that is exercise. A lot of you, I'm sure you maybe exercise, right? You exercise one day, you're like, oh, that felt good. The next day, you're like, oh my god, I hurt all over. Yeah. It's the time lag. Now your body's all inflamed, and it's it started this healing process. Sometimes even it's the second day after that's the worst inflammation. Yeah. I think we had another question over here. Yeah. What, what role do you think um, maybe uh, logs might play in, in just recording more more of the context going on? So you can do at least retrospective critiques. Yeah, that's a great question. So like even tracking your food intake, right? If you use something like chronometer and you know I had eggs this day, I had this. So yeah, you said what is the value of keeping logs? I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Uh, and so a lot of people, especially if you're tracking a lot of this stuff, you saw in both things, the HDL and the sleep, your food choices affected both of them, right? Alcohol, caffeine, um, uh, these are all going to affect these things. So if, even if you keep a diet log, that's a big deal uh, to be able to see what happens with these variables. What about here? So first, just a quick anecdote to answer today's comment that we have shown actually a same-day negative effect of gluten on mental performance, so that's already done. But, but anyway, the, the other thing I wanted to say is um, about exercise and sleep, there's this really thing that's hard to disentangle where when you start exercising, you start sleeping longer and your cognitive performance increases. And then people say, well, there's the better utilization of oxygen by the brain, but you also just sleep longer. And then if you actually want to answer the question, do you just sleep longer or do you actually need that extra sleep? Like are we generating spare cycles or essential cycles for your brain? Then it's kind of hard to determine. And the other thing is that there's a classic, and probably just a few days ago, I saw another study that 
because it uses the, the natural experiment setting to show that consuming blueberries and strawberries is good for your brain. And I don't believe it for a second, but obviously there's a, a huge correlation between the kind of people that consume blueberries and strawberries in their lifestyle. Yeah. So what do you think about this whole natural experiment setting, which obviously we need to use because we can't do control studies or everything, but how can we improve the way science is done, so we don't get crap like this out to the public every Monday. Yeah. Synthesize for people. Yeah, that's a great question. You said to the kind of just some, yeah, it's yeah. synthesize. So, so the your last comment I think was how can you control better for those variables to get better data from things like the blueberry and strawberry studies, things like that. Um, and I would say. I mean, scientists work on this stuff, right? Like there's at least, I, I don't have a PhD myself, but they're supposed to be cognizant of things like confounding factors and controlling for these things. Um, but also it's really hard to control for them all, right? They have so much of a budget and they have to catch as many of the big ones as they can and they're maybe dealing with two or 300, a thousand people um, all taking these things at the same time. So sometimes smaller groups focusing on those really important confounding factors, like the exercise one you brought up is really interesting, right? If you exercise more, your brain functions better, you sleep more, but sleep has to do with memory consolidation. So, whoa, which one's learning? Is it the exercise or the sleep? And you can't, I, I don't know how easy it is to tease apart. Well, that was easy. You limit exercise and sleep, like I did. There you go. <laughs> it works. See, Dave knows about <laughs> confounding factors. He's, he's worked on them. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we might get a chance to draw on Max's um, expertise again a little bit later in the night, so you'll hang around and help us out with the other stuff. So, a big round of applause for Max. Thanks.